the reading of your word, the preaching of your word, the receiving of your word. Lord, may everything that is said and done during this time be pleasing in your eyes and be glorifying to you. Lord, we ask that you would convict hearts and draw people to Jesus so that he might be lifted up and receive the glory that he rightly deserves. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, years ago, I was serving at a church, a large church, and I was serving on their music team, not playing anything. I was doing the, the sound, mixing their sound for them. And it was a, a large music team. There was about eight or nine people on a regular basis leading this, this uh, worship team. And I remember one Sunday in particular, one of the main worship leaders was a guy who, he led worship every single Sunday morning. He was the main singer. And he also led worship every single Sunday evening. He also uh, helped lead worship on Wednesday evenings. He led a weekly Bible study where he was the small group leader. He participated in a weekly devotional text amongst the uh, worship team in writing encouraging devotionals to one another. Not only that, he was involved with the church's missions activities and outreach activities. He was a guy who was really involved in what the church was doing. And one Sunday in particular, after the first service, uh, everybody had left the music room and it was just me and this guy sitting there. And he looks to me and he says, I think I'm done. So what do you mean you think you're done? You're like, you're not leading the, the second service? Are you, are you heading out? Where are you going? He said, no, no, you don't get it. I think I'm done. I'm, I don't get it. What do you mean? He says, well, I don't want to read another Christian book. And I was like, then don't. <laughs> I don't think anyone's going to force you to. You just don't have to read one. He's like, no, you're not getting it. I don't want to read another Christian book. I don't want to sing another worship song. I don't want to lead another worship service. I don't want to participate in another small group or receive another devotional uh, text from someone. I don't want to go out and do outreach. I don't want to stand on the stage and smile and raise my hand. I think I'm done. What would you say to that guy if you were in that situation? I knew the Lord had put me there for a reason. I was obviously supposed to minister to this guy, but I was drawing a blank. Everything that was coming to my mind were things that he didn't want to hear. He had just told me he didn't want to hear it. Here was a guy who had been active in the ministry for years, who was doing more than almost anybody at any church is doing. He was very active in, in all the religious activities. He was participating. He knew the gospel. And yet he was ready to walk away from the faith and throw it all away. What would you say to him? You see, the question that he was ultimately wrestling with during that time was, why is it so essential for us to abide in Christ, especially in times of difficulty? He knew that he should stay in the faith. He knew that he should continue. I mean, Jesus is even going to tell us in this passage, abide in me. But what he was wanting to know is, why is it so essential? Why must I do it? Especially when life is hard. It's the same question that Jesus' disciples would soon face. Right after the passage we're going to look at this morning, Jesus is going to tell his disciples that I'm going away and the world is going to hate you. The world's going to persecute you. The world's going to oppose you. No one in the world's going to like you and they're going to hate you because you're my followers. When that day came for the disciples, they would be asking this same question. They'd say, well, Jesus is gone. And now the world's hating me, the world's opposing me, they're threatening me with death. Why is it so essential for us to abide in Christ, especially when life is difficult? That's the question that we're going to look at this morning. It's the question that Jesus knows that not only his disciples will be facing, but all of his followers throughout the ages. We will face that at some point in our lives. And so knowing that, Jesus prepares us to be able to answer it in this passage. Notice how he starts to answer it in verse 1. He says in verse 1 of chapter 15, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Now, here's the question. Why did Jesus refer to himself as the true vine? I mean, why not just the vine? Everything else, all the other I am statements, he's just been the, the bread of life, the light of the world, the good shepherd. Why now does he throw in that word true? Well, by being the true vine, that implies the existence of other vines, false vines. In fact, Jesus' own disciples would pick up on the imagery very quickly because the vine was the national symbol of the people of Israel. 
The Bible says in Psalm 80, verses 8 and 9, referring to the Lord, You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it, and it took deep root and filled the land. The vine was the national symbol of Israel. In fact, in the, to the temple in Jerusalem, the gates that were around it, above the gates, there was a giant golden vine. And actually, as Jesus is speaking this, they are leaving the upper room and they're headed towards the Mount of Olives. They could see the temple in the distance. It's not, an, you know, it's not improbable that Jesus saw that vine and said, I'm the true vine. The vine was the people of Israel. It was their national symbol. They were the people of God, but they weren't just the people of God. God referred to the people of Israel as his own family. They were his son. According to Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, the Lord said, Israel is my firstborn son. Israel was the son of God, the people of God, the vine of God. And yet, that vine failed. As we saw in our scripture reading this morning, because of Israel's rebellion and their disobedience and their sinfulness, they weren't producing the good fruit they were intended to produce. What were they producing? Stinky grapes. They failed to be and do all that God required them to be and do. Unless we get too boastful. The Bible says the Gentiles, everybody who's not uh, natively Jewish, uh, we're no better. The Bible says in Romans chapter 11 that the Gentiles are a wild olive shoot, helpless on their own. And so we have this picture of, of two other vines that aren't true vines. You have the vine of Israel, which was a, a failed vine that became corrupted and not doing and being what God intended it to do. And then you have the hopeless Gentiles over there doing their own thing, a wild olive shoot. And this is exactly why Jesus refers to himself as the true vine. Jesus is the true vine, the true son of God, the true head of the people of God. As the vine, you'll remember that the people of God were intended to be a people who were righteous and a people who were just, a people who were full of good fruit. And of course, they failed to do that. So did we. So did the Gentiles. We weren't anything that God required us to be, but here's the good news that we see in this verse. It's that Jesus is for us what we fail to be for God. Jesus is for us what we fail to be for God. We were supposed to be holy. We were supposed to be blameless. We were supposed to be righteous. We were supposed to be sinless. We were supposed to be all of these things for God, and yet none of us were. This is what God required us to be. He even said to his people, be holy as I am holy, and no one was. We failed to be this for God. We still fail today. But Jesus didn't. Jesus took it upon himself to come to this earth, take on human flesh, and be all that we failed to be for God. And folks, he did it for us. It wasn't an end in and of himself. He wasn't doing it just for his own good. Jesus is for us what we failed to be for God so that his holiness, his blameless, his righteousness can all be attributed to us by faith. But there's more good news in just this little verse. Not only is Jesus for us what we failed to be for God, but Jesus did for us what we failed to do for God. You remember that the people... We're supposed to keep the law. They were supposed to obey the commandments. They were supposed to imitate God in the world. They were supposed to represent God to the world. We were supposed to produce good fruit, and yet we failed to do all of that. None of us have kept the law perfectly. None of us has even gone a single day without sinning. Just imagine that. Jesus went his entire life without sinning, and every one of us has already sinned at some point today, and yet here we are in the church. <laughs> this is why we need Jesus. And this is exactly why he comes and he lives that perfectly obedient life to the Father. He keeps every aspect of the law, every commandment, every precept. He does everything for us that we fail to do for God so that by faith in him, all of his good works and everything that he did can be attributed to us. So that when God looks at us, he sees the very righteousness of his son, the perfect obedience of his son, and we can be accepted in his sight and join his family because Jesus is for us what we fail to be for God and Jesus did for us what we fail to do do for God on a daily basis. 
There's good news in this verse. But you see, we can't join the family of God on the basis of our own good works, of our own righteousness, our own efforts, our own knowledge, even our own heritage. People say, well, I come from a Jewish background. That's great. You still need to repent, believe in Jesus. You have to believe in Jesus in order to be welcomed into the family of God. We can't join God's family apart from Jesus. The way that the failed vine and the wild olive shoot are included in the family of God is by being grafted into that true vine by faith. You must repent and believe. This is why it's so essential to abide in Christ. It's part of the answer, at least. It's not the full answer, but it's certainly part of it. We we have to abide in Christ because apart from Christ, we cannot join God's family. But I also want you to see that this is, in fact, just part of the answer. Jesus continues to to answer that question in verses 2 through 5. He says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. You see, Jesus is continuing to answer this question and he shows us that apart from Christ, we cannot bear fruit. Not only can we not join God's family, but apart from Christ, we cannot bear fruit fruit. In fact, in these verses, especially verse 2, Jesus is describing two types of branches. And I don't want you to miss this. Both types of branches are connected to the true vine. But one type bears fruit while the other kind of branch does not. And so the question is this, who are these branches that are connected to the true vine and yet do not Bear fruit. Well, some have looked at these verses and said, well, here's a clear indication that a a true Christian can lose their salvation. But listen to me, folks, that is a misreading of this verse. That's a misunderstanding of Scripture as a whole because the Bible makes it abundantly clear all throughout the entire Bible that a true Christian can never lose his salvation. Jesus himself said in John chapter 6, no one can come to me unless he's drawn by the Father. But everyone whom the Father draws will certainly come to me. And if he comes to me, I will hold on to him and preserve him. I'll never cast him away. And I will certainly, absolutely, 100%, that's a paraphrase, but it's true. I will raise him up on the last day and he'll have eternal life. You cannot lose your salvation. Jesus goes on in John chapter 10 to say, No one takes my sheep from my hands. Listen, if no one is able to take you from the hands of God, that means not even you can take yourself from the hands of God. He holds on to his own and he preserves them until the very end. So you cannot lose your salvation. I just want to make that clear. It's a talking point, but let me just, you know, let me clarify it, okay? So who are these branches that are connected to the true vine but do not bear fruit? Well, I want you to see from these verses that it is possible to be connected and not, yet not converted. It's possible to be connected and yet not converted. These branches that are connected to the true vine and yet do not bear fruit are nominal Christians. Those who were Christian only in name. People who like to call themselves Christians. They identify it to use you know, modern language. They identify as Christians. Maybe they grew up in the church. They might even attend church on a regular basis. Hey, maybe even a weekly basis. But not only that, they don't just attend. These people are participating in church activities. They're serving as deacons. They're collecting the offering. They're singing in the choir. They're teaching Sunday school. They're very active in the church. They like to participate in all the things. They they have their own Bible. They know Christian doctrine. They give more than 10% on a weekly basis. Hey, ho, good for you. They're giving above and beyond on a weekly basis. And not only that, but they know all the old hymns. They can quote them by heart and even tell you who wrote them. They look to all these things and they 
call themselves Christians. They are highly connected to Jesus and the church. The problem is they've never been truly converted. The Bible doesn't say be connected. The Bible says be born again. You must be converted. It doesn't matter how connected you are. As long as you are not converted, you don't know Christ. And listen, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I think this describes 75% or more of people who come and sit in pews in the churches in America on a weekly basis. I was going to say 90. I was lenient when I said 75%, but I'll stand by it. We have an entire culture of people who think that they just must be connected to a church and religiously active, do all these things, and yet they don't know Christ personally. They've never turned from their sins and repented, believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ, trusted in him for salvation. But I want you to know, you can have all the boxes of religion checked off and yet not truly be converted. That's entirely possible. It makes me think of the great evangelist, John Wesley. And John Wesley did a, a lot of great things for Christ during his life. A great evangelist, great preacher. Uh, at the age of 22, John Wesley was ordained as a deacon. Uh, not only that, but at age 24, he was ordained as a minister. Also, at age 24, he became a pastor, uh, started pastoring his very first church. At age 26, he took over the Holy Club at Oxford. It was a group devoted to uh, scripture reading and prayer and devotion and singing uh, songs, writing hymns. Not only that, but right after he took over the Holy Club, he, he moved to America and became a missionary and a pastor in America. He did that until he was 34 years old and then he moved back to England. And by his own account, written in his own journals, John Wesley was not converted until he was 35 years old. Don't miss that, folks. He spent 13 years as an ordained deacon. He spent 13 years as an ordained Pastor, He spent 13 years being a pastor and a missionary, a preacher, an evangelist, a church planter. He spent 13 years preaching the gospel and telling people to repent and believe, telling them about the life-giving power of Christ, and yet he himself had never actually experienced it. If it can happen to him, it can certainly happen to you. It is possible to be connected and yet not converted. Here's the thing. People look to their connection to the church and their religious activities as the proof that they're truly Christians. But what these verses show us is that the, the proof is not in the connection. The proof is in the production. It's not about how connected you are. The proof that we are truly disciples of Jesus is, are you bearing fruit in your life? Are you producing fruit in your life? In fact, Jesus is going to go on to say in verse 8, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. The proof that we're followers of Jesus isn't in how connected you are to the church, how religiously active you are, the proof is, are you bearing fruit in your life? Jesus himself said in Matthew 7, 20, you will recognize them by their fruits. And of course, James says in James chapter 2, verses 17 through 18, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, well, well you have faith and, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works. And I will show you my faith by my works. You see, works do not produce faith. That's a misunderstanding. Works cannot produce faith. Works do not save us. But works do authenticate the faith that we claim to have. You can claim to be a Christian all day. You can identify as a Christian. But if there's no fruit in your life, you're a liar. If there's no fruit in your life, you've never actually been converted. And so what is the natural reaction at this point? Well, when we start saying, okay, pastor, I hear you. I need to have fruit in my life. What I need to do now is a self-examination. I need to start looking at my own life and I need to see, okay, is there fruit in my life? And what do we look at immediately? We look at all the external things that I just mentioned. We look at church attendance. We look at our religious activities, our service, our teaching, our, our attendance. We look at all the external things that I just mentioned. 
And, and listen, those things can be evidence of true fruit. But here's what I know. All of those external things can also be done by our own power and by our own efforts. You don't have to be a born-again Christian to sing in the choir. A heathen can do that. You don't, you don't have to be a born-again Christian to churn some ice cream and participate in our social. You don't have to be a born-again Christian to take up the offering plate or serve as a deacon. Any atheist can do those things. You can fake all the external things. And yet that's where our mind immediately goes to convince ourselves and assure ourselves that I'm truly a Christian. Rather than looking to the external things that we can bring about and produce by our own power and might, we need to look at the fruit that only God can produce. The fruit of the Spirit. The Bible says in Galatians 5, 22-23, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Do you see this fruit in your life? Because this is fruit that you cannot fake. This is fruit that cannot be brought about by our own power and our own might. No one is by nature a good person. No one is by nature a loving person. No one is by nature a gentle, patient, kind person as God would have us be. It doesn't come naturally to us. It requires the life-changing, transformative power of God and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He brings about that fruit in our lives. And notice that all of these fruit, they're just, you know, it says fruit of the Spirit. It's not plural, but, but these things should be present in our lives. But, but they don't have to be perfect. I know some of you might be thinking, well, maybe I'm not a Christian because I'm stronger in this area than this area. That's okay. Uh, we all have these in various strengths in our lives. For instance, some of us might be more loving than we are patient. Uh, I've never been accused of being a highly patient person, but, you know, sanctification's a process. God's working on me, so pray for your pastor, okay? Uh, <laughs> okay, quiet down there. <laughs> we can have these in various strengths in our lives, but they need to be present in our lives. We cannot produce them on our own. They only can be brought about by the life-giving, transformative power of Jesus in our lives. I remember reading the story about Bart Millard. Maybe, maybe you've heard the song, I Can Only Imagine, right? Great song. Uh, they made a movie about it a couple years ago. Never saw the movie, but I read the story of how that song was written. And Bart Millard grew up in a, a pretty terrible household. He uh, had a, a father named Arthur who was an abusive alcoholic. Used to beat him regularly, get drunk as a skunk, and just wail on his son. Uh, the, the father was so bad that the mother actually abandoned the whole family, left the son alone in that family with, with the father. And, and despite that upbringing, Bart did come to faith, and he, he joined the band Mercy Me, and, and they started playing their songs on the radio. And, and the son didn't know this, but the father used to sit and listen to the radio and listen to his son sing these Christian songs. And after the songs played, there would be a sermon after the songs, and he got into the habit of just continuing on to listen, and he'd listen to the sermon. And after many, many months of this, Arthur finally was convicted of his sin. He saw that he was a, a terrible sinner in desperate need of the mercy and the grace of Jesus, that he needed to repent and be, be saved by Jesus so that he could have eternal life. He needed to be converted and born again. And so he did. He came to faith in Jesus and Years later, Bart returned home thinking he was going to find that same mean, angry, abusive drunk. And instead, what he saw was a man who was loving and patient and kind and gentle and self-controlled. Bart began to see a change in his father, not so much because his father was doing a bunch of different things or participating in a bunch of activities, but Bart saw a change in his father that could only be attributed to the power of God. And this is exactly what he said about his dad. A beautiful quote. He says, my dad was a monster and I saw God transform him. That's exactly what God can do. 
That's the power that God can bring about in our lives to produce fruit. The the Apostle Paul didn't go from a a persecuting murderer by completing a bunch of activities. He became a born-again Christian and away from being a murderer because he had an encounter with the risen Lord Jesus and experienced the power of God in his life, and he began to see fruit that only God could produce. That's the fruit that we need to look for in our lives. Do you see this fruit in your life? Are you connected or are you converted? Because the Bible says here that those who are abiding in Christ will begin to produce fruit. In fact, uh, Jesus goes on to say in verses 4 and 5 that we must abide in Him in order to bear fruit. That apart from Him, we cannot bear fruit. And so you might be wondering, well, Pastor, how do I do this? How can I begin to see fruit in my life? And what these verses teach us very plainly is that faithfulness to God leads to fruitfulness from God. It's not about all that you can do. It's not about your own power. It's not about your own efforts. Faithfulness to God leads to fruitfulness from God. As we abide in Christ, He begins to work in us and produce fruit through us. He says we must abide in Him. That word abide simply means to remain. Maybe your translation uses the word remain. In the context, it has the idea of continuing on in the faith, remaining faithful in the midst of troubling circumstances. This is exactly what Jesus tells us to do. He says, you must continue in the faith. Continue in me. Abide in me. Persevere in the faith. You see, the reason that it comes from faithfulness to Jesus is because He's the source of all fruitfulness. He's the true vine. A branch that's not connected to Him by faith cannot produce fruit. If a branch isn't connected to the vine, it has no hope of producing fruit. The Bible says you must be connected to Jesus by faith if you have any hope of bearing fruit. And you might be saying, well, what's the big deal? Well, Jesus goes on again in verse 9 to say, uh, or rather verse 9, that if we abide in Him, or verse 8, we abide in Him, we prove to be His disciples. We have to bear fruit if we're going to prove to be disciples of Jesus. But many of us, don't realize the essentialness of that. We don't realize how important it is for us to abide in Christ and and have this fruit bear in our lives. But folks, it is impossible to bear fruit apart from Jesus. He's the source of all fruitfulness. I read the story of a school that had suffered a great fire. A, A fire so bad that they even had children die in this fire. And the reason why the fire was able to do so much damage is because the school didn't have a sprinkler system. And so they wanted to rectify this situation. They said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to buy a state-of-the-art sprinkler system, the best one that money can possibly buy. And so they go ahead and they buy this sprinkler system. They put it in. The janitorial staff, they walk the entire school making sure that every nook and cranny of this school is covered by the sprinkler system. It's finally installed and everybody has this confidence, this assurance. They're saying, all right, we're good. If ever there's a fire again, we're safe because every inch of this school is covered by that sprinkler system. It was many months later when the janitor was walking again that he realized a glaring mistake had taken place. That when they installed the sprinkler system, they never actually attached it to the water supply. What good is that? (laughs) You can have the best sprinkler system money can buy, but if it's not attached to the water, then everyone's in danger. It can't do and be all that it's supposed to do and be. And in the same way, folks, if we are not connected to Jesus by faith, we cannot produce fruit. We cannot be and do all that we're supposed to be and do for God. It comes from Jesus. He is the only hope that we have. And so the question is, well, what does this look like? Uh, The pastor, J.C. Ryle, helpfully said this, To abide in Christ means to keep up a habit of constant, close communion with Him. To always be leaning on Him, resting on Him, pouring out our hearts to Him, and using Him as our fountain of life and strength, as our chief companion and best friend. Does this describe your life? You want to know if you're abiding in Christ? Do you maintain a habit of constant, close communion with Christ? Is He ever on the forefront of your mind? 
Is He foremost in your heart? Are you always thinking about Him, dwelling on His love and His mercy and His grace? Are you always giving Him thanks for everything in your life? Or are you putting your own priorities and your own desires above that of God's? Are you abiding in Christ? When life is hard for you, and it's difficult, and all sorts of trials come your way, are you pouring out your heart to Jesus? He loves to hear from His people. We treat Jesus like I'm going to be a disturbance to Him if I, if I go to Him. Jesus says, pour your heart out to Me. The Bible says, cast your cares on Him because He cares for you. Are you relying on Him as your source of strength to get you through it all? Are you abiding in Christ? And again, at this point, it's natural for us as humans to say, Pastor, I know what I'm going to do. I see that there's a deficiency in my life. I see that I may be not abiding in Christ like I should. So, so here's what I'm going to do. From now on, I'm going to start reading the Bible for this long every single day. And not only that, Pastor, but I'm serious this time. I'm going to make sure I pray at least this many times a day, maybe five. I'm going to pray this many times a day. I'm going to read my Bible for this long every day. And I'm going to make a vow. You hear me now, mark it down. I'm going to attend more than one church service a week. Put it down. And they say, I'm going to do all these things. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And then I'll be abiding in Christ. And listen, Bible reading, prayer, church attendance, those are all good things. In fact, they're essential for the Christian life. But again, Completing a, a list of activities is not going to help you to persevere in the faith if they're done apart from Jesus. You can be involved in as many religious activities as you want, but if you do it apart from Jesus and His power, then you will not persevere in the faith. That's exactly what my worship leader friend was doing, if you remember. He was doing all sorts of stuff. He was very religiously active. He was involved. He was doing an entire list of activities, and yet he still wanted to throw it all away and walk away from the faith. A to-do list, folks, cannot save you. A to-do list cannot help you in your darkest hour when you want to give up uh, saying, I'm going to make sure I do this from now on is not going to help you in that moment. What you need in that moment is not a to-do list. You need Jesus. You need to abide in Him, to rest on Him, to rely on Him, to cling to Him. He's the only thing that's going to get you through that time. Not a to-do list. See, nothing is more sure to keep you going in the faith than dwelling on the love of Jesus. In fact, Jesus says in verse 9, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. Notice Jesus doesn't say, I know you're going to be tempted to walk away. I know you're going to be tempted to throw it all away. I know life is going to be hard, so here's what you do. Here's my list of to-dos, and if you do this, you'll abide in me. Jesus says, no, in that day, in the dark night of the soul, you abide in my love. Remember the love of Jesus. If you're thinking about walking away from the faith, if you're ready to throw in the towel and be done with it all, and just be done with this life, you must think on the love of Jesus. Think on the love that motivated Him to persevere even in the midst of being rejected and mocked and scorned and abandoned and betrayed, denied, beaten and crucified. Jesus persevered through all of that because He was abiding in the love of the Father and He was motivated by His love for His people. Think on that love in the day when you're ready to walk away. The same love that made Jesus persevere will make you persevere. If you want to grow in your faith, Think on the love of Jesus. The love that He showed towards those who were hard to love. The same people that we struggle to love. The love that He showed towards those who were undeserving. Those that the world rejected and despised. Love that led Him to deny Himself and live in service of others. The more you remain in the love of Jesus, the more you dwell on the love of Jesus, think on the love of Jesus, the more you're going to deny yourself and live in service of Jesus and in service of others. You have to abide in His love. His love will keep you going. His love will help you through the dark night of the soul. Not your to-do list. Not your own power. The love of Jesus. So, again, these are just partial answers. Though. 
Why is it so essential for us to abide in Christ, especially in times of difficulty? Well, we know that apart from him, we can't join God's family. Apart from him, we can't bear fruit and prove to be his disciples. But, but what's the ultimate reason? What's the reason that's going to keep me in the faith when I need it the most? And Jesus tells us at the end of verse 5. He says, For apart from me, you can do nothing. You see, folks, especially in times of difficulty, we must abide in Christ. For apart from Him, we can do nothing. We can do nothing. We are absolutely and totally dependent upon Jesus. We can't join God's family. We can't bear fruit. But just a whole summary is we can do nothing. You see, people tell you all the time, well, God would never give you more than you can handle. That's absolute blasphemy. That's a, that's a straight lie from the devil. Of course God would give you more than you can handle. He does it all the time. If God never gave us any more than we can handle, we would constantly be relying on ourselves, trusting in ourselves, and never looking to Him or turning to Him, relying on Him. Of course God's going to give you more than you can handle. And you're going to come to a point when you say, Lord, I can't take it anymore. I'm at my wit's end. I have no more power. I have no more strength. I have no more energy. I have no will to continue on. I'm ready to just throw it all the way. Lord, I can do nothing. And Jesus says, exactly. You can do nothing on your own. Rely on me. Trust in me. Lean on me. Rely on me. My power is sufficient for you. The Bible says that God's power is made perfect in our weakness. God wants us to come to the end of ourselves so that we'll look to Him and learn to trust Him and rely on Him fully. We can do nothing apart from Jesus. I've had atheist friends tell me, well, that's not true. I do things apart from Jesus all the time. And I said, do you realize you just used the air that He gave you to say that you can do nothing apart from Jesus? Even those who would deny Him entirely are completely dependent on Him. They only live and breathe because He gives them air. The reason the sun still shines on this evil planet is because Jesus allows it to rise. We can do nothing apart from Him. And it's important that we understand this, not just as individuals, but listen to me, as a church as well. Because something that churches can get into, churches can be involved in all sorts of activities. Churches can be involved in all sorts of ministries. They can have all sorts of programs. They can be the most visible church in the world. They could have a radio broadcast. They could be on the television. They could produce CDs. Uh, they can go and do a bunch of stuff. But listen to me. If they do it apart from Jesus, it is pointless. A church can do nothing apart from Jesus. The Bible says in Psalm 127 verse 1, one of my favorite verses of Scripture, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. We can do nothing apart from Jesus. And listen, as this church, as George's Creek, we don't want to be involved in anything that Jesus is not involved in. We don't want to do anything that's not pleasing to Jesus. We don't want to proclaim anything that's not in line with the words of Jesus. We don't want to go anywhere that Jesus is not going. We must proclaim with Moses, Lord, if you're not going, I don't want to go. So don't send me. We can do nothing apart from him. This church can only survive by Jesus. This church can only grow by Jesus. This church can only be fruitful through Jesus blessing us. If you ever think that we can do anything in our own power, in our own might, God will humble this church and show us how ineffective and useless we are apart from Him. Everything relies on the power of the Spirit and on Jesus Christ. That's why our number one value at this church is that we are God-centered. That's our number one core value. Because everything we do is for the glory of God. Everything we do is in response to the mercy and the grace of God. Everything we do is for the fame of the Son of God. And everything we do is empowered by the Spirit of God. That is our core value here. Because we know that apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. And so we must 
cry out with the very words that Ryland sang for us earlier. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. Oh, God, how I need you. Let's pray. Father God, we are truly humbled by seeing our dependency upon you. One of our main sins that we commit, Lord, is that we often think that we can do so much without you. Even if we don't acknowledge it with our own mouths, we act as though we don't really need you. We try to do things by our own power, by our own efforts. We don't pray about the things that we do. We don't ask for your guidance. And Lord, when the day of trouble comes, we often look to and rely on our own power to get us through. I pray that you would change that this morning, Lord. I pray that you would show us the hard grace of allowing us to see just how truly dependent upon you we are. Lord, I pray that you would bless our church, that you would help us in all that we endeavor to do for you, that you would empower our ministries, our activities, that they would be spirit-fueled and for the glory of your Son. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mazan's going to come and lead us in a hymn of invitation, and I want to invite you to come to the altar. I know that many people in this church have reached that point that I was talking about this morning. Maybe not now. Maybe sometime in your past. Or maybe you're worried you're going to go through it again. The day when you feel like, I don't want to continue. I'm just, I'm done with this life, with this earth. I'm done with the faith. I've tried for too long and it's been too disappointing. If you're there now, if you've been there, or if you think you're going to be there one day, I encourage you to come to the altar this morning and pray. Ask for God's grace. To press you on. Ask him to help you remain and abide in his love so that you will persevere in the faith. More than anything, I, I pray that you will come if you're one of those I was just talking about. That if you're one of those who's active in this church, maybe you're connected, but you don't know if you've ever been truly converted. You can't say for sure that you're trusting in Jesus alone for salvation today. I encourage you to come and pray. But not only that, if you're one of those who tries to do everything apart from Jesus, you don't mean to. You just forget to acknowledge Him. You forget to put Him first. You forget to pray and ask for His guidance and ask for His power. I pray that you'll come and pray this morning. Whatever you need to do, the altar will be open.